Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon to those who are joining us online. You're welcome to the Institute for Security Studies on this Africa Day. And thank you for honoring our invitation. You're being hosted today by the Peace and Security Research Program. And uh, we would have Stephanie Walters, the head of the program, who also spent over 20 years writing, reporting, analyzing, and researching the Democratic Republic of Congo, and who just returned from the Democratic Republic of Congo to host this seminar, um, which, and she would help us navigate the minefield, which is the political situation in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, before she begins, it is worth noting that as recently as Monday, the Internal Displacement Monitoring Group published a report which noted that 922,000 Congolese were displaced last year alone in instances related to conflict and conflict which evolves around the electoral crisis which has been brewing in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I'm sure Stephanie would lead us through the different mediation processes. Those who have been acquainted with our view on Africa, Stephanie has updated us along the way um, following the death of Etienne Chisekedi, following the mediation uh, by the African Union facilitator Edam Kojo, and following Senko's mediation as well in December. So um, we would let her take the floor. But before she takes the floor also, it's important for us to acknowledge our donors who make these events possible. And these include the governments of Australia, Ireland, Canada, Denmark, Finland, Sweden, Norway, the Netherlands, and the United States of America. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fante. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, so um, there are some people here who I have seen at other, um, other briefings that we've done, um, but I'm nonetheless going to start with sort of a, a look backwards just to explain the context of where we find ourselves of right now. Um, so where are we? May 25th, 2017, where are we? We are five months behind the date when Joseph Kabila, according to the Constitution, was due to have left office. We are close to a year later than elections were due to have taken place. They should have taken place in the latter half of 2016, according to the Constitution. We are uh, about a few weeks out from when the Congolese government and the Independent Electoral Commission had said it would complete the voter registration process, which is now um, not complete and also stalled in certain parts of the country. In fact, it's been um, called off entirely in the region of the Kasais. We also, after two different uh, rounds of mediation, uh, at which I'll go into in more detail in a little while, do not have a stable transitional arrangement. So in other words, the government that we have in Congo today is a government um, that is uh, an interim government for all intents and purposes, but that is not built on any of the um, accords that have been reached over the last eight months. So we essentially have uh, a number of different crises and sources of instability around the elections that still have not been held. Um, now, how did we get here? Um, as many, of, most of you will know, I, I'm, I'm only going to, I'm going to start this talk in 2016. As most of you will know, in the beginning of 2016, it became uh, relatively clear when the government announced that the voter registration process would take 18 months, that the date for the elections, which was the latter half of 2016, would not be met. So essentially, if you start the voter registration process sometime in the early part of 2016, that puts you in the middle of 2017 for that process alone to be uh, to be completed. And that is really the clearest sense that we got early last year that the government was going to be proceeding with this process of delaying the elections. Now, what did that mean? It meant that a whole number of things um, had, to be, had to be addressed. Um, much as the international community and, of course, civil society and the Congolese opposition wanted to insist on the fact that elections take place within the framework of the Constitution, so by the end of 2016, it also became clear that alternative arrangements, Plan B, had to begin to be put in motion. Plan B for that period, which would, which would essentially start when Kabila's mandate ran out in December 19th. And so the first attempt to come up with a plan B that would restore credibility and would give some kind of stability as well during this interim period was a process that was initiated by the African Union. 
Um, the Kabila government approached first the UN, but the uh, UN didn't agree to the conditions of the mediation that the government had wanted. It then approached the African Union in late 2015 and asked specifically for Edam Kojo of Togo to lead the, the AU, AU talks. And the idea was that there be a national dialogue at which all the different political parties and civil society discuss how, how the, this transition government, this interim arrangement would be, would be composed. Um, at that point, essentially, the political opposition and the civil society, re the reaction from those two, two key constituents was that the AU-led process was a process that was already predetermined by Kabila, it was influenced by Kabila, it was a process that they felt at that point still wasn't necessary, it didn't have legitimacy because there was a constitution that very clearly said when those elections had to take place. Idem Kojo um, himself uh, was never quite able to shake off those initial um, allegations that he didn't have the neutrality or the objectivity to mediate that process, and we never saw a full quorum of political opposition joining the AU-led mediation. Um, we had a number of smaller opposition groupings, but we were missing notably the UDPS and the relatively newly formed G7, which is composed of many of the uh, of, of seven political parties and political allies who were once part of the presidential majority. And those two groupings did not participate in the AU-led talks. Neither did the MLC. Um, so we had a very small group of 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 people around that around that table. The UN and the um, EU eventually did sort of lend support to that process in the hopes that it could eventually bring everyone around the table, but ultimately it didn't. And so what we had was an accord that was signed in October 20, 2016, which many, uh, and myself among them, would say was the worst case scenario. It put elections at 2018, and it had no explicit language about whether Kabila would, would, would stand for a third term. And this has been one of the key issues, of course. Will Kabila leave office? Um, or will he try and stand for another term? And uh, the strategy that we're now in the middle of watching is the strategy where there is no explicit decision on that, it's just that we're having delays and delays and delays. So this accord has no language about Kabila leaving office after two terms, it has a 2018 um, election date, and it also doesn't have language about whether or not Kabila can change the constitution or hold a referendum that would allow him to stand for that third term. So really not something that was going to restore credibility. Um, and, and yeah, so a, a very worrisome uh, accord indeed. Um, Sadek and the ICGLR at a summit that was held a few weeks after this accord was signed um, praised this uh, outcome but behind the scenes a very important player, Angola, essentially had a very different message for Kabila, which was this accord doesn't hold water, it's not inclusive enough, and it's not going to restore credibility of your government, it's not going to lead to a legitimate transition period, and you need to go back to the negotiating table. So Kabila, who um, knows very well that Angola does play an important role militarily, politically, and otherwise in uh, the DRC and has for, for about 20 years, listened to this uh, warning, this advice, however you'd like to see it, and then asked the Catholic Church to step in and mediate essentially a second round of talks. Now the choice of the Catholic Church was a very good one. They have played traditionally and historically a very neutral and positive role in the resolution of other Congolese political crises and have also played a big role, for example, in the 1992 Conférence Nationale. Um, and they have that domestic credibility that this process needed um, and that ownership, I think, as well. So it was a very good choice. The um, Senko, um, as they're called, the, the Conférence Episcopale, um, started the talks in November. The key date that everybody was concerned about was December 19th. What would happen on that day that everybody knew Kabila's mandate became essentially unconstitutional or extra-constitutional? Derek, you can help me with the wording, perhaps. Um, and that was the, 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 the big concern was to avoid the kind of conflagration, popular protests that we'd seen in Kinshasa on other key dates, and to avoid that for December 19th, because there was a really big concern that it might lead to the kinds of confrontations between the population and security forces that we've seen over and over, where there are a lot of civilian casualties, and not just in Kinshasa, but in a uh, number of key cities across the country. So. That was avoided because essentially the population had been given this sense of hope that maybe this Catholic-led process would actually come up with an arrangement um, that, that, that could lead to credible elections. On December 31st, um, much to many people's surprise, Senko came up with a political accord which was signed by all the key parties. 
This one differed dramatically from the October Accord. It had explicit language about Kabila not standing for a third term, and it put the election date um, within 2017. It also called for a government of national unity with all the different signatories participating in that, um, and it uh, created a, uh, a follow-up committee, it's the CNSA, which, whose main mandate was to make sure that this interim government kept on track and delivered on the elections. And that CNSA was going to be led by a key member of the Rassemblement. The uh, Rassemblement uh, is the key op opposition alliance. And also in the accord, it's stated very clearly that the prime minister should come from the Rassemblement, so also from the opposition. So on paper, really not a bad document. Um, many people with hindsight will fault the Senko for not making it more ironclad or I airtight. I think that you know um, they did the best they could, and under the circumstances, they delivered something that, that was inclusive in terms of what it needed to address and what addressed the concerns of the Congolese people. Of course, already shortly after it was signed, everybody's cynicism kicked in, um, and rightly so. I mean, what made the government make so many concessions, and would it really stick by this, this accord? Because for all intents and purposes, if it had stuck to this, it, all of its efforts to try and delay the elections would have just bought it maybe another six months, maybe another year. So very early on, questions. Are the, is, the, is the government really committed to this? In the month of January, we then saw um, a lot of back and forth, still mediated by the Senko, about government positions. Who gets what ministry? Who gets defense? Who gets justice? Who gets interior? Who gets the, the key ministries? Which of the components? Very little progress made on that um, in the month of January. Um, another sticking point that was raised at that point already was exactly how would the prime minister be designated by the opposition. Would it be one name, as the opposition said? The opposition said, we will give the president one name for our candidate, our nomination for prime minister. The government pushing back and saying, we want three names and we will then choose from those three. So those are the two big sticking points. Then a, 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 a completely unpredictable, a cataclysmic event, which is the death of Etienne Chesekedi. Etienne Chesekedi was the leader of the UDPS and also therefore the leader of the Rassemblement de l'Opposition. He dies on February 1st in Belgium. Um, Chesekedi had been ill for quite a long time, but nonetheless this, the timing of his death uh, was incredibly damaging for this, for this particular process. Um, Throughout the month of February, we then have both a mourning period, but also we start to see kind of ongoing back and forth about, um, you know, wh how, who's going to take the position of leading the CNSA now that Chisikedi is dead. That was a job that he would have been assigned to. And we start to see the kind of dissolution of this unity we had seen uh, in the opposition under the Rassemblement umbrella. We start to see people disagreeing about whether Felix Chisikedi should lead the party or whether other people should lead the party. And this unified front starts to crack. Um, now, as we had anticipated, this is something that the government was more than happy to take advantage of. Um, and I mean, it should be said that the, the UDPS itself, the party itself, had already um, had particular camps. Um, that, so this isn't the beginning of, of, of splits within the, within the UDPS, but it, it really is, the, is what led to the all-out kind of dissolution of it as we once knew it. Um, Senko continues to try and keep the negotiations on track throughout the month, month of March without much success. Again, sticking points, which government ministers, how do we nominate the prime minister, uh, and so on. In the meantime, we have a new rassemblement, rassemblement or a, let's say, a competitive rassemblement being formed under the name of Joseph Olengankoy, so somebody who's now challenging Félix Tshisekedi's right to run the rassemblement. Now we have two rassemblements and creating uh, generalized confusion. The Senko, the Catholic bishops, decide to withdraw from the process in, 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 in mid-March, essentially saying they've taken it as far as they can, and it's now up to the parties to show political will and to put their own personal and poli political interests uh, behind, behind them and, and, and form a government of national unity for the sake of the, of the Congolese people. All of this, remember, is just to put in place a government that is going to lead the country to elections. So we now, we've lost the plot completely. We've lost the big picture. We've now got a bunch of politicians fighting for jobs, fighting for who controls what ministry, fighting for who controls the Comité National de Suivi, um, in some cases for very sincere reasons, but often not. Um, and all of this because we're meant to be having elections. And all of this is costing us time. If the accord had been implemented on, in the first week of January, perhaps we could have met the deadline of having those elections by the end of 2017. Now it's March. 
we have all these splits, all this bickering, we still don't have a government, we've lost three months of preparations for those elections. Um, in, in April and May, we then see the government deciding that it is going to pursue its own strategy with the implementation of the December 31st Accord. And what is that strategy? That strategy is now to engage with that branch of the opposition that has split from the main branch. So the main branch, led by Felix Tshisekedi, um, is being sidelined essentially by the government, and the government is choosing to do business with the newly formed, uh, not terribly legitimate and credible uh, um, um, uh, offshoot of the UDPS led by Olenga Koy. It nominates uh, one of the members of that, of that offshoot, Bruno Chibala, as prime minister, violating the December 31st accord, um, and then nominates a government in early May um, that, is not, that doesn't include any of the key members of the UDPS or of the G7 or of any of the other parties that form part of the, the, the legitimate rassemblement. So we now have a prime minister who really doesn't have a political base, and we have a government uh, uh, that's meant to, um, to, to, to oversee a transition period that doesn't have credibility, that doesn't have legitimacy, it lacks inclusivity, and it certainly isn't going to restore people's faith either in uh, this, this, this period or in the process of preparing the elections. So really, we went from worst case scenario with the October Accord to, I'd say, best case scenario with the December Accord to a total collapse of implementation of the best case scenario and back pretty much to worst case scenario now. Um, today we have a divided and a disorganized opposition. Um, the infighting continues. There's absolutely no plan B. There was a real belief that this December 31st accord was going to work. And there's also this, uh, this, this real sense amongst the opposition, I think, that the international community is going gonna, is gonna to really lead, lead the charge against Kabila and that they can really count on the international community to make sure that um, the elections are held and that they're held in a free and fair manner. Uh, and that's kind of it for the plan from the opposition for now. Um, the Congolese government is determined to forge ahead with the arrangement it has now, with the government it has now, led by Bruno Chibala. The foreign minister has been touring African capitals, trying to sell this arrangement uh, and explain to everybody that it was not at fault. Uh, it's not a lack of political will on its side. It's the weak opposition that fell apart that has scuppered the real implementation of the December 31st acc accord. So it's on this big charm offensive trying to kind of convince key players, including the African Union, that the arrangement they have in place is a legitimate one. The international community, France, Belgium, the UN, all the key players, keep going back to the December 31st Accord. This is the document that they say is the roadmap to elections. They haven't moved, they haven't compromised on that issue. Um, they haven't openly necessarily criticized the Chibala government, but they've gone as close as they possibly can. It leaves them in a difficult position. Um, because they, haven't, they don't have much room to maneuver. Uh, and they're now sitting with a government with whom they might have to cooperate to organize elections if we ever get there. Um, and there's not a lot of dialogue at this point. So it's a very difficult situation. And what we're seeing is probably a continuation of the punitive options, the punitive measures we've seen. So we already have sanctions from the US. We have sanctions from the EU. And we think we're probably going to get another round of sanctions from the EU in the next coming days on key officials. Um, and that's related to the human rights situation, which I'll speak with quite briefly uh, at the end, and I'm sure you'll have questions about that as well. Um, the Cong Congolese population's position on all of this hasn't changed. If we believe a, a recent poll that was done by the Congo Research Network and by Bercy, 51% um, of the Congolese population say a Chibala government is not legitimate. 69% um, of people say that Kabila should have left office in December and 83% 80, of people support the implementation of the December 31st Accord. So you can see where, where, the, where the emphasis and where the sympathies lie. Congolese still want that accord, that inclusive government, to be formed and for that to, to, to take the, the country forward. Um, the regional players. Um, we haven't heard much from SADC and the ICGLR. SADC did send a relatively high-level delegation of vice ministers, vice foreign ministers, up to Congo in April. Um, it's the second time they've done that since uh, last year. 
Um, they spoke with the government, with the opposition. They made a fairly, uh, let's say, key error um, in by inviting both branches of the opposition and then asking one branch to wait while it spoke to the other and um, sort of in a way that Kojo also um, uh, sort of negatively influenced his own image. They have delegitimized de de themselves in some ways as a, as a neutral player. The sense amongst the opposition is that Sadek is going to back Kabila no matter what. And so I think that in terms of being a, 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 a possible broker for any kind of future talk, Sadek for the moment isn't the right, <coughs> right choice. Um, in terms of regional players, to bring it back to Angola, uh, which is still the most important uh, outside player um, regionally and I would say internationally, there have been some interesting developments with Angola um, that have been very closely watched. And Kinshasa is very keenly aware that Angola is going to play a deciding role or could play a deciding role, as it has in many other times, but always in favor of Kabila since, um, since Mobutu was ousted and where this, this might be a slightly different scenario. Um, the Kasai, uh, um, the violence in the Kasais, which I can answer if there are questions about that in the question and answer period, but I won't go into too much detail, um, has displaced 1.3 million people. 25,000 of those um, are refugees who have, who have moved into Angola. That's not a very huge number by the standards of, South Afri of, of African refugee flows, but the Angolan government is not happy about this. It's in a region of the country, Lunda Norte, where there have been uh, many um, issues with illegal immigration by Congolese, uh, by Congolese, and there have been just sort of diplomatic issues over expulsions of, of Congolese from that region. Um, it's something that the Angolan government doesn't want at a time when it's preparing for its August elections. It's concerned about having these undocumented people running around. Um, as, they, as they put it, there is now an HCR camp, um, and they are being um, managed by humanitarian agencies. But it's not something the Angolan government is happy about. We saw last week an official statement that the um, Angolan army is moving, has moved to that border. It's a 2,500 kilometer border that Angola and DRC share along the Bakongo area, but also all of the Kasai provinces and then into Katanga. I should have had a map, sorry about that. Um, the Katanga area is also not, uh, not, a very, not an area that's very supportive of Kabila, so the potential for this conflict to move from the Kasais into other areas that border Angola is very much there. The Angolans know the Congolese army well from having worked with them between 1998 and 2003. They've also trained them. I think they understand that if they want to keep stability along their border, that's going to be a job they'll have to do themselves. Again, a resource drain at a time when they don't have a lot of resources and when they um, don't necessarily want to be distracting from the democratic process. Um, another interesting development is that Angola um, participated in the International Contact Group meeting on the Great Lakes in Washington last week and signed a bilateral military agreement with the, with the United States. Um, this is also something that, of course, will be interpreted in many different ways in Kinshasa and by Kinshasa, um, and it's something that we're looking at as, as, as well. Um, finally, and this is, this is also something that is talked about very much in terms of Angola's um, potential intentions, uh, Sandika Dokolo, who is married to Isabel dos Santos, um, President dos Santos's daughter, Sandika Dokolo is from Congo, and he never really raises his voice about Congolese politics or African politics. I think he usually prefers to stick to African art issues. But in the last few months, he's spoken very clearly about the lack of governance and about the problems with the Kabila government. Now, in Congo, people look at that and they say, you know, how can the son-in-law of, um, of, the, of the Angolan president be making these statements if they're not supported or not endorsed by, this, by, by, by Dos Santos himself? That's, of course, up for speculation. We don't really know, but it is another new element. Um, how exactly Angola might um, exert leverage, of course, is another question, and, and we'll be continuing to look into that. But Angola is a, is a, is a very important element here. Um, then finally, just to, just to maybe pay some or acknowledge the title of this event, which is what is the end game, having created the expectation that I might know what the answer to that is, which I don't, of course, but I think that it's fair to say that the end game for Kabila, and I mean, we've asked ourselves this question many times, does he want to stay in office? Is this just a delaying tactic? Is it about finding the right person to succeed him? Is it about... Uh, securing his interests and feeling that he can get immunity. I mean, what exactly 
is going on here. I think the end game for the Kabila elite, and I'll speak more about the elite rather than just him, is to control the electoral process, to control the current transition, to decide when Kabila leaves and under what terms, to avoid ret and to avoid rep uh, retribution. And then finally, to ensure some kind of continuity for the elite itself, whether through the current political vehicle that they have or not, but for this particular elite and also Kabila's family. He has a very large family which has significant interests. Um, the end game for the Rassemblement, and I'll speak just about the Rassemblement because there are lots of different pockets of opposition, which I, it would be too confusing to go into now, but the Rassemblement being that kind of symbol of, 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 the, of, of what the opposition represents, they are still sticking to the December 31st Accord. I don't know how they're going to move away from that, whether they're going to move away from that. I did already mention that they don't have necessarily a good plan B. Uh, they want a government of national unity in which they are included. Um, they probably want Felix Chisikedi to be the prime minister, and other, but they definitely don't want it to be Bruno Chibala, who's the prime minister right now. And they want free and fair elections. Um, and those are conditions I think we're not likely necessarily to see. The international community still has largely overlapping interests with, um, with the opposition. Um, they want a transparent election process, a government of national uni unity, uh, the application of the accord, and a clear sign that Kabila is going to leave office. Um, so if you put those end games up against um, each other, they are somewhat mutually exclusive. So um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Uh, there's lots more that we can say and lots more we can talk about, but um, maybe that'll come up in the question and answer period. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Stephanie, for providing us that background information and what has been happening in the DRC and catching us up from 2016 all the way to the dynamics at the moment. And um, it's interesting um, how you trace the actors and the changing landscape of the actors as well, the opposition splintering and um, after Etienne Chisikeda's death and how the issues though have remained rather static with the opposition maintaining a hard line, of a certain part of the opposition, and the government maintaining its own position on trying to delay at all costs. Um, and the understanding of who the regional players are and what they're thinking and how they're appraising the situation is also very important. Now, uh, before I go to the question and answer session, I might want to introduce myself as well. I'm Fonte Akum and I'm a senior researcher in the Peace and Security Research Program out here. Um, the question and answer session would be held under Chatham House rules. Um, the, so implicitly, um, if there are any reporters in the room, before quoting any individuals, you might want to contact them after the discussions to, with, to seek their permission before quoting them. And we would go ahead with the question and answer session. Uh, and we're also going to, for our web audience, most unfortunately, since this is under Chatham House rules, we'll be getting off the web at the moment and living the, restricting the discussion to this room.